Hi, I'm Liz Harper, and I'm back with Sarah Light, and we're here with Jim Pingray. Jim, do you mind introducing yourself? Yes, um, I'm PCA, and I'm also a C, well, PCA pest control advisor and a CCA certified uh, crop advisor. And I work currently working at Coosa County Farm Supply, and I've been uh, there for about 20 years. And prior to that, I was in the uh, flying business and the ground spraying business uh, since the uh, early 80s. So I've been around agriculture for quite some time. Yes. So um, in your experience as a PCA, um, how do you see IPM correlating or impacting soil health and vice versa? Okay. Well, you know, we always have IPM as far as when it comes to insects and disease and whatnot above the ground. And there's really no IPM guidelines for soil, but the concepts and the principles apply where you have to rely on natural enemies. So you've got your good bacteria versus your bad and same with good fungi versus uh, bad fungi. So you're, you want to create a very diverse, um, uh, you know, ecosystem, bio biosystem below the ground to help prevent a lot of, uh, you know, pest pressure, disease pressure. So the concept's the same, but there's no guidelines. <laughs> That's great. And what, um, what specific soil health practices have you implemented or recommended to the growers that you work with? Well, the simple thing, of course, everybody's compost, okay? But the compost part sometimes is over, um, overused, thinking, okay, I put compost on, I'm good, I can do anything I want to my soil, but there's a little bit more to it. I, I, we don't put a lot of compost on, but we put some, you know, we'll put a ton and a half to a couple of tons, but the key is finding a compost that has a good carbon and nitrogen balance, because if you have too low of a CN uh, ratio, you're gonna get too much bacteria, and you're gonna burn things up too quick and then too high of a carbon nitrate, you got too much fungi and you're gonna get some tie up. So I'm always looking for something that's in that 12 to one to 16 to one ratio. So that's always a good thing. But I, I feel the compost is only a starter kit, just something to get things going as far as the biology goes. And then on top of the compost, we're adding a lot of uh, organic acids, uh, folic acids, humic acids, uh, and we're adding also some uh, carbohydrates, sugars, uh, to kind of give the biology a food source. We're even, in some cases, we're even inoculating some of the soils with some beneficial bacteria on occasion just to kind of jumpstart it. But uh, yeah, and then it's we're mixing these with fertilizers. And the key is, is uh, on these carbohydrates and that. But the key is when you do mix it with fertilizers, they soften up the fertilizer so it's not so harsh on the biology. Um, and also what you do is you make sure the fertilizer amounts that you're blending with these uh, mixes aren't high amounts so you could lower the uh, salt index of your inputs because the biology doesn't like high salts. And uh, so I guess the biggest thing too is on implementing this is knowing what you're putting in the soil and is it gonna hurt just you got to know that that soil is alive. So mm -hmm. you got to know, okay, I'm treating this. Uh, this is actually a, a, you know, a live piece of, of, of your you know, farming that you're trying to implement and you don't want to do anything to try to damage it. So that's the, that's the mindset you got to have. And um, there's other amendments too, but uh, that's, that's a pretty deep conversation as far as that goes. So yeah. That's so great. And in implementing those practices, you talked a little bit about soil biology and the relationship with IPM, but what are some of the other really specific benefits that would be of interest to growers from implementing these soil health practices? Yeah. So we're seeing, you know, I'll, if it takes two to three years to really get the momentum going, mm -hmm. but in two to three years, you'll see your nitrogen inputs lower considerably. We're going to have a lot more, um, it seems like we're not losing as much, you know, it's, it's, there's a much better holding capacity within the soil. Um, 
and I could go a little deeper into that because when you do, um, uh, and also I think you're creating some nitrogen fixing bacteria also, mm -hmm. but what it does more than anything is it creates a much more efficient um, uptake of nitrogen because when a, when a plant takes up nitrogen in the ammonia form or the uh, nitrate form, it takes it up in the plant and it's got to convert it. So it takes energy for that plant to do that. Well, if you got a really good soil biology, that conversion process happens in the soil profile. So it's taking up nitrogen in the form of amino acids. And so it takes no energy at all. It can implement that nitrogen source uh, right away without expending any energy. So your photosynthesis, photosynthesis that's creating is not being expended just to help with that conversion. It's not 100%, but there is, um, I do see some benefits and then that leads to the next thing because of that, I'm seeing less stress on the tree. Because mm -hmm. when you're, when that tree's busy trying to digest that nitrogen and convert it once it's up in the tree and the plant, I say tree all the time because I'm thinking perennial systems. Mm -hmm. Same goes in the plant though, any, any, um, anything that has photosynthesis it has to convert it to a useful form. Nitrogen in the plant that has no use whatsoever. It has to convert to amino acids and, and peptides and whatnot for it to be used, used correctly in the plant. And, and a lot of people don't realize that. And the nitrate nitrogen actually takes the most energy for a plant to convert. Um, so again, that's less, less stress. So as soon as you reduce stress, you're immediately gonna reduce your disease pressure. Because oh, wow. diseases are triggered by plant stress. I've seen it, you know, our growers over water, no oxygen in the profile, that mm -hmm. triggered a stress event. Right away, boom, it triggers a disease. And that was going to lead the other thing. With that biology in the soil too, what you're creating is a better air exchange in your profile because of the pore space they're creating. And because of that, you're able to irrigate your water holding, capacity is better, but also your air exchange within the soil profile is superior. So you're able to do both because what's difficult, and that's what happens in these hot days we have in the summer, is trying to give that plant enough water, but still, that plant still needs oxygen. So if you suffocate that plant, you're going to trigger, a, you know, um, some sort of stress environment, which then will trigger some sort of disease possibly. So, um, yeah, so better air exchange in the soil. And um, I think that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's not a nutshell, but that's, that's it. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And so with all those benefits and in your many decades of experience, what are some of the barriers to implementation? Because we still do see relatively low rates, you know, of adoption of some of these practices. So a absolutely. Yeah, they're, and they're big barriers. Stopping. Uh, growers from implementing it if we know all the benefits that you've described really um, eloquently just now? The, the big barrier is, you know, the mindset of the NPK mindset. The, the barrier is to get the grower out of that NPK mindset and know that there's much more to the plant health than those three things. Uh, there's, there's micros, there's trace elements, and, uh, and um, there's, you know, so you have to get a grower that's willing to um, you know, a lot of times what happens too is you'll see growers that are having a difficult time and it's easy to come in and say, hey, there's a better route. But, um, and you're going to obviously have a hard time with a grower that still seems to be profitable and, and right. is doing well. But what I guess I'm trying to say is, is the barrier is to get them to realize that it's, you could do, better with less inputs and that's a head scratcher for most of them that the inputs are a little different also so it's that's that's a big barrier and you got to teach them a little bit so you got to have a grower that's willing to be taught a little bit because you got growers that don't want to be taught they're they're very difficult you know they're gonna unless they absolutely trust everything you're doing but in my experiences it's better to have a relationship where they know exactly why we're doing certain inputs. So the biggest thing that's overlooked is the micros and the trace elements. So I try to do a lot of, um, of uh, adding a lot of 
natural mind products um, have, you know, multiple, we're talking 40 something different uh, trace elements that is used in the plant function. It's not essential by any means, but it's, it enhances performance. <laughs> and we're seeing that quite a bit mm -hmm. where we're using those. Perfect example is seaweed. Seaweed has 74 different uh, trace elements in it. Mm -hmm. And that's because in the ocean, it's able to collect anything it can, what it needs. And that's why we're finding out in farming that uh, kelp has been a great, great product that we implement in these type of systems, both for the soil biology and as a foliar in the plants. That's so cool. And I love that all of this is happening kind of within the conventional system that you're, you're adding more tools um, than just what we conventionally think of um, for agri in agriculture. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we finish up? Yeah, uh, and, and you're absolutely right. That's, we have, we're using, it's, it's amazing how many organic products we're using in conventional farming but we're seeing the benefits. And like I said, we're, we're, we've cut back on our nitrogen, we've cut back on our potassium, you know, we've cut back on our, uh, the phosphorus <coughs> because we're finding out some. The other thing that we're really, what I wanted to share is uh, good biological soil basically makes you, you know, because right now in the chemical method of farming, you've got to be precise with your, your timing and your injections and everything else for a very good biological system. You're allowing the, the plant and the soil to communicate and, and take up what it needs at the right time. So I think that's the other aspect that is really helping with the plant health is you're just basically uh, feeding that soil and giving it a good active baseline. And the microbes are actually mining that soil of the phosphorus, of the potassium, our, our, our levels that we get in our tissue samples are much better than what they used to be when I used to have these high input uh, farming systems where we used to put a lot of potassium and phosphorus and whatnot. And we can never get our levels up to where we really thought they should have been. Now I'm getting levels that are just like, where does this come from, you know? And so that's, that's the thing that we're seeing is uh, the, uh, there's less antagonism within the soil, you know, with a, and, and there's, a, there's definitely a, a much more, you know, synergism within. But the other thing that also isn't really known is there's actual some beneficial bacteria and fungi that the plant takes up and is used for plant health and functionality within the plant. So having a good biological system, you're allowing, they're called endophytes. I don't know if you've you heard of endophytes. No, I haven't. They're very, they're 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 a big part of the system that, you know, I'm trying to, uh, you know, I know, you know, you know that it's definitely helping with uh, what's happening within the uh, plant function, and I guess the other thing is is uh, I learned a lot of this stuff, a lot of reading. Uh, I know it's difficult. A lot of growers were all busy and all that. But during the winter, that's when I find a lot of time to read. And there's some good books out there. I, the book that kind of, it's more of a story than a uh, actual something that I was able to implement as far as tools to use. But it was a story of a grower that struggled with conventional. Then he started going more, um, he doesn't go organic still. He's, he's but he used a lot of organic methods and it was uh, Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown. Oh, yeah. It was a great, great story on how a struggling grower was just not making it where he, he changed his practices, used a little more biology, implemented some good rotations. And now he's got a thriving business and very profitable, doesn't need subsidies. So that's a good, that, that book's more of a story, but if a, a book that I read that I thought was very good to, got some great tools where I could use as an agronomist was a biological farmer by Gary Zimmer. Mm. Uh, I love that book. And I actually recommend that to some of my growers. I bought it for them and handed it out to them. And then he's got another edition called the advancing biological farmer. 
And he does talk about all the different uh, uh, elements and the importance of them. And, and he prioritizes how to balance your soil. And then um, I could go on on a few more books. Um, the Hidden Half of Nature was an interesting book. Uh, that's a parallel with the human biome and the uh, soil uh, biology, how very parallel it is with um, chemical um, agriculture versus biological agriculture and then big pharma versus, you know, that, mm. the, the benefits, the pros and cons, so it weighs both sides out. So it's kind of a cool book. Again, you know, it's not a lot of take home stuff there, but it's a good story. Mm. And it does get you to be more uh, a believer in the system. And then um, anything with William Albright. I'm a big William Albright fan. I think he was way ahead of the game. He got pushed out by uh, uh, big fertilizers, uh, you know, that had uh, uh, a little more money to give the college and his system got pushed out. But uh, looking back, that was a big mistake. You know, he's, uh, he was way ahead of his game. And then uh, the last book, and it's a pretty simple read. It's a good way to balance your soil. It's called The Ideal Soil by uh, Michael Estera. And that's, that's good at trying to, how to start your soil and get it in the right position and then move forward from there. Yeah, I know that's a lot of information. Yeah, I do a lot of reading. I love I'm all, recommendations. I'm always reading because in my opinion, um, there's, there's more to learn at all times. I'm, I tell my growers that the budget will never be the same or our inputs because uh, that if, if they are the same, that means I've, I've quit learning anything, you know, so they're always constantly changing. And we seem to get, every year we get better and better because of that. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on our, um, a part of our virtual soil health mob. So, um, and we hope to keep in contact and maybe revisit um, for another book recommendation in a year or so. <laughs> sure. Follow. All right. Well, th thanks for having me.